Thank you very much for coming to hear uh, what I've got to say. I think a number of you were in the talk I gave about an hour ago. Uh, I'm not going to repeat too much of that, uh, but this session was billed as a discussion session. So I've got a few slides that I'd like to talk about, and then I'm hoping we can have quite an open discussion. It's not too big a room and we can chat about uh, some of the things that I've told you about today and uh, which I'm trying to get people to understand the importance of. Uh, so I'm Professor Charles Hume. I'm Professor of Psychology and Education at the University of Oxford. Um, I've actually recently retired from the university uh, and I'm now spending most of my time uh, in this uh, company called Oxed and Assessment, which is a university spin-out company. So it's one of these things that universities make from research. And then we've created a company basically to take our research through to application in the real world. Um, I've been um, studying children's language and reading problems for slightly embarrassing, maybe about 45 years. <laughs> I started studying these issues when I first um, uh, began my PhD in Oxford uh, many, many years ago. Um, but one of the things I guess I've learned is how difficult it is to take research through to practice. So for many, many years, I've given talks to teachers about our research and people have come to me and said, well, how do we get that? And I say, oh, well, we've not published it. Uh, we've got all the materials, but we've never published them. And uh, so this is what Oxed exists to do really, is to take our research, publish it, and actually make it available. Um, so what I wanted to talk to you about this afternoon, and when I say talk to you about, I mean, and get you to talk to me about what you think, is um, about the nature of oral language skills, why they are so important and what and the fact that we shouldn't just accept language as something that exists before school we should think of language as something that at least in part schools should provide the environment to facilitate the uh, development of language and that's been that's slowly gaining traction in the UK, but I'm not sure how far it's gained traction in societies like the UAE. And I still think in, um, in the United Kingdom, language, which is sometimes now referred to in the education system as oracy skills, oracy skills are still seen as like the poor relation to literacy skills. People in English schools are obsessed with children being able to read, and I'm obsessed with that as well. But reading is, um, to quote uh, something I was writing about yesterday, um, uh, one of the one of the early great heroes in the study of the development of reading was a linguist called Ignatius Mattingly. And Mattingly famous said that reading is parasitic on, on, on speech. And uh, I and my collaborator took that phrase and said, well, we agree with Mattingly, but reading isn't parasitic on speech. Reading is parasitic on language. All reading is, um, all is taking language that's been put into printed form and converting it back into language. So without language, there can be no reading. We can't read if we don't have language. Um, so language is, is an absolutely fundamental skill. But nearly everything we do in life, I mean, language is one of the quintessential characteristics of being human. Some members of the human species don't have language, but they're a very, very disadvantaged section of, of our species. And in most of our lives, our language skills 
<laughs> are central to everything we do, whether it's learning to read, making friends, keeping friends, um, gaining information about the world. Most of this happens uh, through language. So uh, another issue is that sometimes people are a bit puzzled by, well, what do you mean by language? Because it's almost taken for granted. I remember many years ago, um, my wife and I were having a dinner party and we said to the people at the dinner party uh, that we were sort of raising money for children with developmental language disorder. And this was a group of maybe 10 people, all highly educated, and they said, what do you mean by developmental language disorder? And we said, you've never heard of that? They said, no. They said, but you've heard of dyslexia. They said, oh, yeah, we know what dyslexia is. It's children who can't read. Well, you've heard of autism. Oh, yeah, we know about autism. You know, our friend's child's got autism or whatever. But they said, we've never heard of developmental language disorder. But developmental language disorder is a term used for children who have problems acquiring spoken language it's every bit as common as these other disorders but it's much much less well recognized and when we talk about language maybe it's a bit hard to understand what the parts of language are so let's uh, talk about that uh, in a moment so the still of you again this is a, a UK centric view maybe but I, I think it probably applies quite widely to other parts of the world. When children enter school, we kind of expect them to be competent users of language, and many of them are competent users of language. By competent users of language in, in a school setting, I mean we expect to be a, uh, kids to be able to listen to what people say to them. We expect children to uh, follow instructions without asking for clarification. We expect kids to be able to speak to us and tell us what they want or what they've understood. Um, we might uh, hope that children can uh, express their thoughts uh, and ideas to others in the classroom. And as I've said, language is central to uh, creating relationships and friendships. Um, so what is oral language um we can distinguish between expressive language skills which means talking and l and receptive language skills which basically means listening so if you've got good language skills you can produce language and people will understand what you're saying you can convey your thoughts in language and you can understand language that's spoken back to you uh, mm -hmm. so you've got both expressive and receptive language skills now we can think about this in terms of what's been referred to as uh, the communication chain which is um, this idea um, so the communication chain makes the idea that there's a constant cycle going on when we're using language. On the left-hand side of this communication ch chain, we're talking about children's receptive or input language skills. So in order to have good receptive language, we, may, we need to be able to listen and, and attend to what's being said. We need to understand the individual words. Words are, I, I sometimes say, like the bricks in the wall of language. Without words, we don't have any language, but words are the basic building blocks of, of the whole of language. But if we can understand words, we need to then put those words together to understand sentences. Um, the, the sentence the dog chased the cat has a different meaning to a sentence, the cat chased the dog. They both involve the dog and the cat, but the subject and the object have been reversed in those two sentences. That's grammar. That's a big part of understanding spoken language. Um, 
And then at, at the higher level than sentences, when um, we um, produce a lot of language or when we read a, 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 a passage in a book, or listen to a story, uh, as many of us do while we're driving, we're building what psychologists refer to as a mental model. You're creating a, a representation in your mind of the events and how these different events relate to each other. This is all part of the input or receptive language part of the communication chain. But when a child then wants to speak, uh, we are talking about output or expressive language skills. In order to do that, we have to be able to choose the words needed to communicate what we want to say, put those words into a sentence. Uh, notice there's, there's a parallel here, understanding sentences, producing a sentence of your own. These are both involving grammatical skills. Um, uh, combine sentences to, to build a narrative. Again, put several sentences together to, to create a story uh, and to speak clearly uh, and fluently. So this idea of a communication chain is to say that um, there's a cyclical process going on when we're learning and, and using language. Um, this is a slightly... Uh, artificial process at the moment. I'm speaking and you're listening to me and I hope I'm making sense and you're understanding me. And in a few minutes, I'm going to try and hand over to you to do some of the speaking and I'll try and, and we'll have a communication chain going on between us. Um, oh. So when all of these things come together, they allow children to use language to understand and follow instructions, to express themselves. And having this effective communication chain has massive benefits for, for children's education. Almost everything that happens in formal education takes the form of spoken language. Pretty well everything we do at school involves a teacher explaining us what to do, listening to the teacher, understanding them, maybe writing about what we've learned in the classroom or whatever. This is all about language. It's language, language, language. Um, and as I said earlier, this, these language skills are not only important for education, but they're absolutely key for um, social development and social relationships. Virtually the whole of our social lives involves speaking to people, listening to people, understanding what they've said to them, understanding that um, this person's interested in what I'm saying, understanding someone else may not be too interested in what, what I'm saying. That's referred to as pragmatics. Those are very high level sort of skills to do with the socially appropriate use of language, which are uh, typically disturbed in kids with autism. Um, anyway, but, but language is, is central to our social lives. Um, there's very good evidence that if we look at children's development with age, if we had children who are having language problems early on and we don't do anything, the, the gap between children with poor language and good language gets bigger as children get older. It doesn't get smaller, it actually gets magnified because what this signifies is that these kids are already learned more language than these kids and they're going to carry on learning more language than the kids who are struggling to learn language and the, and the problem just gets worse and worse and worse. And that's why for the last... 20 or 30 years I've been focused on children in the orange here and what we can do to try to facilitate their language development. We're probably never going to close this gap and bring these kids up to the level of the green, uh, the, 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 the best developing kids, but we almost certainly can narrow this gap. We can, we can make these children better users of language and improve their 
educational outcomes and uh, social lives uh, as a result. So, um, just to explain a little bit more about the importance of language, one of its key importances in education is as a foundation for literacy. Um, I showed a diagram earlier in my talk that from a study that we did, uh, published uh, in 2016, I think, where we took a very large sample of children, uh, about 300 children, many of whom we had selected because they were a family risk of dyslexia. That is, many of them had a parent or a sibling who was dyslexic. And we followed those children from being three and a half, well before they'd learned to read, through to being eight. And what we found in that study um, really surprised and kind of <laughs> unsettled me a little bit, but I, I do believe what we found is absolutely true which is that children at age three and a half who had poor language skills went on later to have great difficulty learning to decode words in reading when they entered school and later still uh, that transferred to having problems in understanding what they were reading. So language skills at three and a half were having what I would call um, effects on the development of decoding which were mediated or explained by problems in learning the relationships between letters and sounds but also having later difficulties in understanding text that they could decode. Now as I've said many people think that language is just not part of education and I guess I'm on a sort of um, crusade to try to persuade people that language should be seen as a central part of what we're doing in education particularly when we're talking about the education of children who don't find these skills easy. I just mentioned earlier about how poorly recognised language difficulties are the current terminology for children who have language difficulties is to call the, 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 that problem uh, developmental language disorder. We used to call about we used to talk about specific language impairment. With kind of the terminology has changed a bit, and we now talk about developmental language disorder. The best estimates from epidemiological or sample whole sample studies of children is that somewhere between 7 and 10% of all children have significant language problems, developmental language disorder. That's almost exactly the same rate as we'd get if we looked for kids who were dyslexic uh, or had a number of other disorders. So these, these problems are common. It's not really weird to have a language problem. Maybe 1 in 10 kids has some sort of clinically significant language difficulty. Another thing about language problems which really bothers me is that they're very strongly correlated with social disadvantage. So the strongest predictor of a child having a language problem is that they come from a poor home background. Um, <clears throat> the reasons for that are probably quite complex. Uh, they reflect... Um, environmental influences, children from poor backgrounds probably are exposed to a, 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 a worse language environment. Uh, their parents probably speak to them less. Classic study by Hart and Risley in the US originally described this phenomenon uh, where they showed that the differences in vocabulary knowledge between children from middle class homes versus children from disadvantaged homes was very, very large at the, at the point of school entry. And they documented big differences in what language those children were hearing, in, hearing at home before they came to school. There are probably also some genetic factors accounting uh, in, important for that. Um, and finally, another uh, challenge is that many children 
are maybe coming to school and maybe getting educated in a language which isn't their home language. Uh, in the UK, we refer to that as uh, children who speak English as an additional language or EAL. And uh, a study, a big study of children uh, coming to school in England speaking English as a second language showed that proficiency in English is a very strong predictor of success in school. Um, that's not surprising, but 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 these are these are very strong effects. So, in other words, you come from a poor home background. You enter school with poor language. You're at the bottom of the graph there. Nobody does anything about it, and you carry on being at the bottom of the graph. And um, that compromises the whole of your life chances. It reduces your educational attainment, reduces your employment prospects, et cetera, et cetera. So we've kind of got a, um, a cycle of disadvantage here going on potentially with children coming to school with poorly developed language skills, nothing being done about it, going on doing poorly in school, um, maybe having other broader uh, social problems and indeed possibly mental health problems. Uh, this is a quote, uh, again, This uh, given I'm in this foreign country that's very hot, it seems a bit, uh, what's the word, um, egocentric to be talking about something from the UK, but this was a report, Burko, John Burko was the Speaker of the House of Commons uh, in uh, in the UK, and he was very concerned about language impairment, and he was uh, uh, chaired a, a review of language difficulties. Uh, and a quote from that report is: "More than 1.4 million children and young people in the UK have speech, language, and communication needs. Language disorders alone is one of the most common disorders of childhood." affecting nearly 10% of children and young people. In areas of social disadvantage, this, ri this can rise to 50% of all children and young people, including those with delayed language, as well as children with identified speech, language and communication needs. And as I said, these problems of language are associated with a whole set of um, knock-on uh, consequences. Um, literacy uh, development's compromised. These children don't learn to read very well. That has a knock-on effects to poorer educational outcomes. This transfers into poor, poorer employment prospects and it also puts people at, at higher risk of um, mental health. Uh, problems, including anxiety, depression, and um, so-called um, so-called externalizing disorders. Um, so, in psychiatric terminology, people often make a distinction between internalizing and externalizing disorders. Internalizing disorders are things like ang anxiety and depression. You're unhappy, but no one knows too much about it. <laughs> Externalizing disorders are things like uh, being violent or disruptive. People do know about it. Uh, though those problems, both internalizing and externalizing disorders, are more common uh, in people with language disorders, particularly people with severe language disorders. So it's important to try and do something about it. Um, so language skills, I'm saying, are vital for social emotional development and our adjustment to school. There's actually some quite good studies showing that children with language disorders have poorer relationships with their teachers than children with better language skills. And it's kind of the, what you'd want would be the opposite, that the kids with the language disorders would have better relationship with their teachers. They need their teachers more, but they actually, the teachers you know, find it difficult to, to, to deal with these kids. Um, as I've just said, uh, these children have a uh, higher risk of emotional and behavioral disorders. Uh, they also have higher levels of so-called conduct disorder. Um, 
reading problems are also associated with elevated risks of mental health problems, both so-called internalizing uh, problems such as depression, anxiety, and um, aggression and conduct disorder. Uh, I'm not sure. Have you come across conduct disorder uh, as a terminology? Um, I better not swear, but it basically means being a very unpleasant child <laughs> or adult. <laughs> These are the people who end up in prison <laughs> or in, uh, yeah. Um, and um, these um, problems are probably partly reflect so-called threshold effects. They're most, they're most, you're most likely to get these um, additional problems associated with language problems as if, if you have severe language difficulties. Um, and here's a rather striking uh, figure by adolescents somewhere between 33 and 43 percent of children with developmental language disorder meet clinical cutoffs for social and emotional and behavior problems um these that that's a very very strong relationship um okay um So what I talked about at, at length before in my lecture was the fact that we have developed a whole range now of language interventions that show that we can definitely improve language skills in school. And um, that, I think, is, is very important. And our approach there is a very simple one. It's not that we bother too much about why someone has a language disorder. We just say... This, these children have poor language, give those kids to us or give them to their school staff that we've trained and something can be done about it. These kids' language can improve. After all, language is quintessentially something we learn. It's not something we're born with. So giving them good language input, very highly structured language input, can, can improve uh, children's language abilities. Um, I think this is a version of a slide I, I showed earlier. So we've developed a whole suite of uh, language interventions that um, Nelly Preschool is a, as its name implies, a preschool language in program that's a really um, what I'd call a language enrichment program for all children in nursery. So it takes every child in the class and seeks to improve their language skills. We've just published a study on that in the last few months, uh, maybe weeks even, that shows quite clearly that uh, our, for, for, for whole class, at a whole class level, this program improves all children's language skills by a measure, uh, this is a technical term, but by a measure of a course of a standard deviation. Now, a quarter of a standard deviation is quite a big effect. So this is something the kids like, the teachers like. We can improve everybody's language abilities by quite a sizable amount. Why not do it? I mean, this is just, you know, that there's, it's enjoyable. The kids like it, the teachers like it. Why not give it to everyone? The Nelly program is for slightly older kids again massive amounts of evidence that this works and we've now taken elements of this really and transferred it through to working with old kids but but the general point I'm making is that there's a whole set of programs we've now developed that are proven to improve children's language problems uh, uh, language abilities um our research has been funded extensively by um, a body in the UK called the Education Endowment Foundation, which actually exists to try to bring evidence about uh, educational processes more in line with the sort of evidence we would have in medicine. And this is a quote from Professor Becky Francis, who's the chief executive of the Education Endowment Foundation, 
and she says it's hard to overestimate how exciting it is to see a program have a significant positive impact on a national scale. This gives early years educators a program that they can trust to help children needing additional support with their communication language skills, particularly those from disadvantaged backgrounds. And actually, this rollout of Nelly all was made possible because of the COVID pandemic when the government got very concerned about the effects of that on educational attainment. And as a result of that, we've had funding to roll out our programmes and assessments to roughly two thirds of all schools in England now with uh, uh, the, 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 the numbers of uh, children we've helped and the numbers of teachers we've trained is, is, now, is now huge. Um, so just to summarize, um, we've started this uh, spin-out company from the University of Oxford. We're a science-based company. We adhere to very high standards of evidence. Um, our focus is on oral language because oral language development is so fundamental to the whole of education and, and, uh, and other things besides. Um, and so what I'm hoping is that we can now have a bit of a conversation about what I've talked to you about. See if you believe me that language is quite important and how we can work to uh, improve it in, in educational settings. Uh, I think that should be the last slide. Yep. Okay. Um, let's, have a, let's have a talk. Let's get the communication chain going. Um, how, you, know, you mentioned um, those learning English as a second language. What about dual language learners, which a lot of our children living in, in uh, Dubai and UAE are, are dual language learners? How much impact is that having on language development? By dual language learners, do you mean kids are brought up bilingual from, from day one um, or day two? They, no. They're learning Arabic at home. Yeah. Arabic could be their mother tongue, but it is, it is colloquial Arabic as opposed to the modern standard Arabic, which is what they learn at school. So that's on its own slightly complex. Yeah. And then when they go to school, they, they then learn English. Okay, so I think for those children our language programs would be ideal. What the research evidence we have shows is that those children respond at least as well and possibly rather better than children who are coming from purely English back backgrounds. Those kids don't have... have um, some kids have language problems at, at for because they have genetically... they're poorly equipped to learn language and they're always going to struggle. But many children like you describe from uh, dual language backgrounds don't have a have a have a, a language lear an intrinsic language learning problem. They just need more high quality language input, and that's what our programs provide. I would say. What age do you assess the children with, um, and how do you identify those with um, oral language issues? So we use our app called Language Screen to do that. Um, it runs on a tablet or a, or a phone. Uh, it can be used by any um, adult, really. Uh, it takes about 10 minutes. Get a very highly accurate assessment of a child's overall level of language ability. And that then can lead, uh, guide the schools as to which children mostly need language support and allow the, uh, the schools also to monitor the progress of those kids as, as a result of intervention. Yeah, as a follow-on to Isabel's question, is, are there any projects to um, produce this in Arab? Uh, I've been speaking to someone, she's not here, but I've been speaking to someone while I'm in Dubai about the... Uh, we're hoping to translate the both the language intervention and our language in, in assessment into Arabic, but but it's not. That's probably going to take a year or two. <laughs> but, because just anecdotally, someone in my extended family was diagnosed with something called auditory processing disorder, right. which means that they could read the words, but they had trouble verbal understanding the meaning. 
yeah, um, and yeah. They were pulled out. It, it was in Canada. They were pulled out into a, a separate school for maybe two or three years, uh, where they focused on uh, perhaps some of the supporting uh, uh, techniques that you spoke about. But they were then able to go back to mainstream education and have graduated from university. And that. for me, I think it was, I was amazed to see that you know these things can actually be helped. Yes. Yeah. No, they definitely can be helped. They can definitely be helped. And seeing it rolled out in this way is amazing. First of all, apologies for walking in late. That was unintentional. Uh, and you may have already said this, but can you tell us a little bit about the techniques and the strategies that are involved in Nelly? Sure. Um, so Nelly uh, now comes in a variety of flavours or, or, or types, but the basic core of the Nelly programme, it's all about oral language. It's about giving children a lot of language input, so there's lots of listening to stories. And then, but, but there's a bigger, uh, the, the, the two big elements, uh, two of the big elements in Nelly are direct teaching of vocabulary so you teach children the words that are occurring in the stories whose meaning they would would not otherwise understand and the work on oral narrative by narrative i mean storytelling skills um so kids listen to a lot of stories they get taught the meanings of words that occur in the stories uh and the the children are then encouraged to retell the stories often using pictures as prompts to uh, uh, my, maybe a sequence of three pictures uh, that summarise the main events in, this, in the story. You can put the pictures in the right order. Child, child can reorder the pictures to tell the story and then the, they can use the picture prompts to, to produce the story themselves. Now, when children with language problems try to produce a story, what they say is often very poor. They may come up with a single word or two word utterance and the person delivering the Nelly program has been trained. We have this online training platform and the person working with the child when they come up with a very limited utterance takes that utterance and expands it and gets the child to repeat it. So you're leading the child to produce more and more complete utterances and that's a technique called scaffolding. But there's a lot of evidence that this process of trying to produce language yourself is a particularly effective way of, of learning language. If I want to learn Arabic, I'm a bit old, I think, but if I wanted to learn Arabic, I would need to be speaking Arabic, not just listening to it. I might learn something from listening to it, probably would, but there's very good evidence that I would learn more effectively by trying to produce Arabic and having my productions corrected. And that's a core part of, of, the, of, of the Nelly programme. So just a little supplementary follow-up. Yeah. Would you not say that that is an aspect of good quality teaching? Not program, program learning, but good quality teaching. I think it is. Um, I wouldn't want to say that what we're doing is unique to us at all. We've taken the best evidence techniques from many people's previous work. Um, we, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants, how this is the phrase, isn't it? Um, but I think the unique thing is that we've kind of, as I say, put it in a can. It's here in a program. It's scripted. Uh, and we give very high quality training and su and then mentoring support to people doing this work. So it's just really making it all more accessible, I would say. I, I wouldn't want to say we've uh, invented something completely new. I agree with you. A, a good teacher would be doing this, but many teachers perhaps haven't had the right training and, and aren't aren't sufficiently aware of it. And I still think that many teachers, first of all, you know, I think language screen is quite revolutionary. If you'd spend 10 minutes with each child in your class, 
you'll have a very accurate assessment of their language skills. And you may be very surprised to find that Johnny, who sits at the back of the class and says very little, actually understands almost nothing about what you're saying to them either because they've got a language disorder, but, but they're quiet. So nobody knows about these children in, in the classrooms. So I think in that way, language screen is quite revolutionary and it sort of provides teachers with the way of understanding the range of language abilities in their classrooms and makes them sensitive to that. And then the, 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 the sorts of training we provide, I think, then provides people with a means of doing something about it. Is it different types of language that your assessment would pick up? So things like abstract, abstract words, you know, honour, courage, yeah. um, things like that which you can't see. So it's sort of a cake or a, mm. a, a shop or a bus, it's, it's an abstract. I mean, is that what uh, you would... We, we, uh, we focus on teaching children what are referred to as tier two words and that's a a, a phrase from uh, Beth and McEwen who used that phrase initially these are words that are unlikely to be known by the child but which are of wide rel relevance to to, to 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 language and um, they're not always abstract but they sometimes are but, but for example in one of the slides I showed earlier from Nelly preschool one of the words we teach children is the word float. Well, it's not completely abstract, but it's a bit, you know, it's not like ball or apple or something. Um, and it was kind of quite interesting when we created this program because there were a group of us working on the program. I remember sitting and saying, OK, so how are we going to explain to a three year old what the word float means? It's not that obvious actually how to do it. But, you know, you, you, you go to the dictionary, you look at the, the dictionary definition, you simplify it, you put it into pictures and et cetera, et cetera. You know, you know, I mean, I've always taught children float and sink with yeah. doing it. Well, yeah. Um, in, a, in a group, though, it's maybe hard to have things. If, but, but we have pictures of things floating. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. there's nothing really for children than actually... To demonstrate. No, well, um, I agree with you, uh, enacting language. Um, so another word we teach in uh, the Nelly Whole Class program is shake. And there's a song, and people shake. Yeah, <laughs> that, uh... yeah, 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 yeah. And how do you get around shake and shake? So shake is uh, the name of them, the song ruler or dignitary and shake. When yeah. you have that kind of... Um... So you're talking about uh, homonyms here, yeah. and uh, we we don't we don't t tell them about the sort of shapes you have here. We just talk to teach yeah. them about shake your hand. So, so bow where you bow, but a bow, a bow, and a, a yeah, yeah. Um, well, bow the tree. Again, we're talking about young kids with language problems, so we're talking about getting basic word meanings into their heads. I would say. So what is the most important? I'm sorry, I'll stop now. Probably. No. no. Um, what is the most important types of vocabulary for children, young children, to have at their fingertips or in their brains? Well, um, kind of all words are important, but these tier two words, you know, um, a few years ago, I, I still remember learning the word rebarbative. Most people here, I think, won't know what the word rebarbative means. And that doesn't matter because it's a weird word, has very little relevance in everyday speech. Rebarbative means off-putting. And etymologically, it derives from barb in French, which is a beard. So it's a hairy, rough, hairy thing. It's off-putting. Anyway... It doesn't matter that you don't know the word rebarbative, but what we're trying to teach kids are tier two words are selected to be um, important words to understand for, for the general operation of language, I suppose. So float and sink, above and below, behind, before and after, uh, which are examples of terms we would be uh, teaching 
are absolutely central to understanding the world and, and what people are telling you about the world. So, um, yeah, our aim is to build, you know, the foundations for language. I, I, this is a, a slightly difficult idea to, to explain to you in just a couple of minutes, but um, what I think one of the surprising aspects of our work is that these changes we have on kids' language seem to be persistent or enduring, which is great. But I think we take kids and change their attitude to, to learning language. We take kids who find language difficult and we, we turn them into more active language learners. It's like, oh, I can do this stuff. I don't understand this word. But if I ask Isabel, she'll explain the word to me and then I will be able to understand it and I will be able to learn it. So um, that's what I call a metacognitive effect. It goes from, you know, if you're not good at language, you can just sort of fold into yourself, you know, crumple up and, and, and disengage. Or I think with our programs, we turn children into more active learners who actively engage and seek out information. We teach the kids, if you don't understand something, ask and, and you'll find out. So I think that's um, a broader aspect of what we're doing. We are discussing about different language barriers in everyday. So, don't you feel that you, know, you mentioned that poor background of maybe you were less well up people from the households? Don't you feel this nativity factor is actually creating a problem? In, suppose again, Dubai, if you see, I come from a different nativity. Maybe a Filipino comes from a different nativity. When they come into a common cultural background, the development to them, the you know, way of dealing with them, as for the trainer's level or as for the you know, faculty level, it actually creates a barrier and actually creates those language disabilities more. Um, I'm not sure I completely understand what you've said, but I think you're saying that differences in cultural background may relate to language problems. Still though, yeah, still though English is a global language, yeah. spoken by everybody, but still it is considered as a native language of England, when yes. it is from that English speakers. Yeah. I come from a background where I have learned English from my early years to my adult age, and I have a very strong command of the language. Yeah, but do. still, <laughs> but still, I am not considered to be more, you know, appropriate for the language because they say your mother tongue is Hindi, or somebody says your mother tongue is Arabic. Shake. Right. So this background, this difference, and this concept of nativity that English is from England or English is from this nation. That actually creates language barriers in multiple backgrounds? Mm. Well, I guess we're all, I would say, all we want to do is to reduce those barriers as much as possible. I think you're right that there may be um, cultural differences in the way different groups use a language, in, including language uh, like English. I mean... Um, someone uh, near the back of the room from the US and uh, you know we, we joke about English and Americans being divided by a common language we speak the same language but it's kind of different so, uh, you see the two languages actually uh, British, it's, British, it's American English. There's British English and American English and there's Indian English and there's Philippine English and I don't know there's uh, when, when you go to Singapore they talk about Singalese this is the English dialect that they speak in Singapore. These are all dialects, but um, we're trying to break those down and we're probably, as I said in response to an earlier question, we're really trying to get the fundamentals of language in place and working as well as it can do, rather than worrying too much about these higher level, subtle differences. You know, if... if um, if I say boot and an American says trunk for the thing at the back of your car, we eventually figure out what the other person means and we joke about the fact that one person's used one word and the other person's used a different word. But, uh, yeah, but we're really concerned with taking kids who have real language 
communication problems really and bringing them up to a level where they're communicating adequately to benefit from school and and to learn to read and I mean another thing I would say is I know this meeting is very much about reading for pleasure but you can't read for pleasure unless your language is of a sufficient level but once you start to read of course there's reciprocal relationships between reading and language a lot of the vocabulary I know I've learned from reading and books I read contain vocabulary like rebarbative that nobody would ever use in a normal conversation so reading is a powerful driver of learning language and we learn lots and lots of words from reading that we rarely or never encounter in spoken language but it is part of language at, at the end of the day but but these words don't occur in in spoken language at all frequently somebody there with a yes, you mentioned this Melly program and it's about giving children the words and teaching them the words but if we go back to you know a communication language disorder and a child has a problem speaking the yeah. child in my class that back in September was only using hand actions to talk right. I was trying to get her to produce words. Yeah. How can I, I don't have an area in the classroom, I'm not going to get an area in the classroom anytime soon. How can I support children taking EL out of it? They, they have a fundamental communication problem. They, they, can, they cannot get the words out. And this, this girl, it, it's, it's not an EL issue. It's a, there's a barrier to her oral communication. So this child's, uh, how old are they? Uh, she'll be five in July. Okay. Um... All I can say is in the context of our research on Nelly, we've had lots of uh, questions from schools that, uh, that go along the lines of, well, we've got this child, they've, they've scored very poorly, their language skills are too limited to benefit from Nelly, and we just say, please put them into Nelly and we'll see. And many schools have come back and said, we thought this child would be unable to benefit from your intervention but actually they're now speaking and they're now they're actually creating sentences when they were virtually non-verbal at the beginning of the programme. So I think these, I mean, the child you described sounds as though she's got severe language issues. All I'd say is do some structured language work with her and, and she may well respond to it. Start gently with easy words, picturable items, uh, get, get her to produce them, get her to... Uh, tell her very simple stories when she comes up with a, a single word, a, a response to a question, expand what she said, try and get her to repeat your expansions. She, with her, the fact that she's not communicating, is she, the muscles in her mouth, are we like missing a, like a, a window that she's then going to have a problem with clarity of, of speech further down the line? Okay, that's uh, um, something I haven't talked about today, but I'll say something about it very briefly. So we make a very clear distinction between language, which are central processes, and speech, which is the articulation of sounds. Now, I've never seen the child you're talking about. She may have a speech disorder. That's a, 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 a problem in actually articulating the sounds. I don't know. Um, speech and language disorders often go hand in hand, but not always. I'm talking, I've been talking today about language disorders rather than speech disorders. Uh, but without seeing this child, I wouldn't know whether she's got a, uh, but if she's not speaking at all, you won't know whether she's got a speech disorder or not. Has she seen a speech therapist? So that, I would say, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that, that would be really, really helpful to yeah. see whether it is um, an inability. I mean, she might have spoken and no one understood her, so she stopped because she couldn't make the sounds, and that, that is often, that can be. But, I mean, without seeing a specialist, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. So I think we're, we're out of time. We're out of time, okay. But Charles, can I just say on behalf of us all, that was incredible. I've never come across this uh, topic about, about language and realising that there were so many children who were impacted by it. It's a really common problem and um, 
I'm on a mission to try and communicate that to people. We've, we've, certainly, we've certainly benefited from your very strong message and, and for this to be an important part of um, education. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for listening, everybody.